we're able to tell it. But if you could give us a little background on you, um, I know that uh, Stephen Steve just said that you the war broke out when you were twelve. Give us give us an idea of what was going on uh, at age twelve. What happened? <laughs> If I, if I would have to go back, uh, the age 12 for me, the war was nothing else, only excitement. Because as an age 12, as a boy, I was interested to know what's going on all over. Even when the Wehrmacht walked into our hometown, I was uh, dancing around as a boy around them, and they were giving me candy, you know, because. You know, they were sitting in the motorcycles with the machine guns, and I walked around with them. I spoke a little German, so they, I, I, I took it like a, like a plank, you know, with the boys. Did not realize what will happen day by day. I started to grow up day by day. In 1942. When they walked, when they executed the entire Jewish committee, they waked me up. This was my growing up in my life. It was something I didn't believe I could see, but I took it. This is the first time in my life as a boy I saw executed people, and my father did. Did told me as a all the, the only boy he was, he said, "You go and try to help other boys to bring these people to the cemetery." This is how the life started with the Nazis. And the secretary, which was working in the Jewish committee, told us, "Boys, you don't stay in the town." Just run any place you can. Go to work because they will shoot. Executions will go on every day. And I took it serious and I left house. I left the house and I went to work voluntarily to a bridge, you know, it's about 25 miles away from my hometown. And I was working there until 42. And then for, after the deportation of the entire Jewish people to Belzec. I have to stop the word Belzec because a lot of people don't realize that Belzec was a commercial dead place, a commercial killing. And uh, being as a boy, even other boys, non-Jews, wanted to find out where those people go. The transport, in August, this I will never forget, I came home to say goodbye because they told me uh, August 19, 1942, that the, all people from the vicinity are deported to Belzec. I never heard before this, what, what is Belzec? But they find it out that this was a, a, a death camp. Nobody was going alive. The entire Galicia was ex was gassed. They were using gas in the in the in the in that camp. Nobody got out. There was nobody. If you didn't escape the train and you arrived there you were dead. And this is how my entire family was also sent there with the transport on August the 20th, 1942. It took a three days journey, I found out. No water, no nothing. They walked in to a camouflage walk, which was 10 feet high. They didn't know the, the sign said uh, in German, and thousand come, you know, or I don't know, there's a different word which was written there. 
people didn't realize that as you walk in, you're not coming out. This was the death of my entire family, the entire Galicia. Over 600,000 people were gassed in that place. In this way, I, today, I, I, I try to digest Germany, this word Germany by itself, as they were the founders of commercial care. No science, no doctor, no, no professor could imagine this word, you know, this commercial killing. And when you say commercial killing, it it was a just a loss, six hundred thousand lost, correct, Leon? Six hundred thousand gassed, killed. Over six, the whole Galicia is laid in one year. In this yeah. had in few months. Yeah, Not we're the, talking fifty thousand people. The, 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 the trains were going in and out. You know, empty. When you and I was working, you know, by the bridge in the Polish friends. I was a teenager. I was not afraid to go around and look what's going on. They were telling me this. Everybody was deported to Belsons, and and this was a death camp. There, they used the gas. And they were not burned. They had ditches. You know, they were the 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 place was built on a uh, on the border about five miles away from the Ukrainian border. In the the place was full of ditches. So they were not. They were the people were. They took away everything, and they were throwing them in ditches. So after the war, I went there to see what's going on. Nobody was interested. When I talked to the local people, they say to me, this is not our uh, interest, except in, in Polish. This is a Jewish problem. This was the answer. You know, I said to him, what do you mean a Jewish problem? You leave here and you were so what was going on. You, you leave, you know, thousands of people laying here, not not even a sign, nothing. So I applied with a special memorandum to the Jewish Congress in New York, and they started to 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 clean up the place and put in order, you know, the towns because you cannot put in order the names, so they put. The order, the towns all around who were exterminated in that place. This was Belsons. Tell me, Leah. Let me ask you. Tell me how you you said that your and I'm sorry. You said your your whole family um, was terminated. I don't know what language you said. What what word you used? But you lost your entire family. How did? What was your survival process? Because I think you talk about it in the book, the horse adjutant. How did you? How did you figure out how to survive through that? What was, give us the story of how the horse came into play and why that was such a big, uh, big factor in your survival. After this, when I lost my parents and everything, and my father told me, try to stay with the horse. He said, because they like horses. So if you're going to stay with the horse, you might have a chance to survive. My father gave me certain links of love. He said, but he told me, you will, you, life will, will teach you. Life will give you the experience. He said, we will not come back. He said, to me, this was the goodbye. He said to me, we are not, you will come back. This is what he told me. And I said to him, I couldn't talk to my mother because she was crying. I had four little sisters. They were all crying. They all were deported the next day. I came a day before. You know, it was a Wednesday I came and Thursday they were deported. It's it's very hard to describe. It, nobody believed that those people would be killed.
So when they when they all were deported, the people don't forget the environment around. People, Polish people, the, the Christian people were sitting in bars drinking. They were playing. They, they, they were biased. No, nobody on the train should give water or something. You know, the trains were going like, like the, the, this would be a, a tourist place. You know, so I'd, when I went back to, to work because I escaped from a camp, from a slave camp at that time. And I, I, I took all, all my, even I took some clothes from the house because my father was breaking the house the day before the deportation. He was, he was trying to, to leave nothing. You know? So, you know, the environment was very, very, you know, sad, very sad. Even the neighbors, which were non-Jews, were also upset. They didn't realize. I used to go in there. They had kids my age. I used to play together. You know, everything. You know, uh, uh, we were friendly. And rapidly, you know, the situation became completely different. You know, the barbarians, the Nazis, the killers. I call them the killers. They, get, they didn't give a damn about what was, they were trying to, to kill everyone. They were executing, you know, the, the elite of the Jewish people. Ben, can you move forward to, to the ghetto Tarno? Hmm? Can you go uh, tell us about how you survived by going, uh, the next step was... The survival, my survival was, uh, it was divided in, in few parts. The first thing I was driving, I went to the ghetto, Tarbo. There I had a cousin, my first cousin, and it was of the our family, my father's family. And they took me in. I was 15 years old in the ghetto when I was. And they said to me, you, if you want to drive a horse, we're going to talk with Salomon Vestrach. I put it in the book. Mm -hmm. he, will, he will take you, he will leave you. And I went to him. He said, yeah, you, you, I will take you. You will sleep in the stable. You sleep with the horse. The horse was machek. This was the name. Mm -hmm. and, and he says to me, uh, he was a beautiful person, a young man. He said to me, you're going to eat in my house? And if you go out, he said, from the ghetto, you can sell some, you know, clothes or anything and bring some. And I was doing it. I was doing it. And the... There were seven drivers in the ghetto. And my number was seven of the of the carriage. And the Gestapo, which is the Geheimstadt Polizei, German, but I spoke German. They were living, you know, in the best house in Tarnov, where they had the wives and children, you know, in the offices. And they always were calling to the Jewish police or to the UNRWA to send the boy with a crew cut with a match. I was, the, 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 they became like, I didn't look Jewish. I looked more German than they. So they, they had a, the reason just to call me because I don't look Jewish or I look more German, I have no idea. They, they, until the liquidation of the ghetto, you know, I was driving with them. I was driving with them in many places. And I watched executions five feet away. And it, uh, the, the, when I came to the ghetto, 
So when I left the ghetto, people used to ask, like usually, Leo, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the, with the I was on the, with the horse. I have to get out to the, to the gate. You know, there was two gates. So the main gate, I have to go out. Drive out. So people were walking and they were asking, Leo, where are you going? I said, they the Gestapo come. When I said this, it spread all over people who were hiding. I didn't realize that what I that I helped people to hide. I didn't. I, it, it was not in my mind even, because they they asked me where you're going when you drive from the place to the to the gate. It's a half a mile, or in the, in the, in the gate stays a, a, a German policeman and a Polish collaborating with. And I was driving slowly. So people walking, the, the, the adults, you know, people, well, where are you going, Leo? So I'm going to this. When I said this, it spread like a, like, like, like a lightning, you know, and people were hiding. They said, Leo, I did not realize that I saved people. You saved the people, didn't know it. So, but see, some people survived. Leon, what happened? How did get, uh, the ghetto tunnel end? The ghetto tunnel was liquidated on August uh, 20, uh, 20, 1942. 1942. Mind you, he's 96 years old and a perfect memory. A beautiful memory, better than mine. Mm -hmm. It was liquidated. Yeah. I, the names I keep, I have all the killers on my record here on the head. Mm -hmm. And when you say liquidated, Leon, how mm -hmm. liquidated death camp, how many people uh, perished? You're talking about the ghetto? Tarno, yeah. Get, they, they executed, the last part was about four, four, four or five thousand people. Between four and five, because the mass grave was already dicked when I came there. Mm -hmm. So they were 10 feet deep, you know. But that's after they evacuated a whole bunch. Yeah. Huh? That's after many were taken out of the camp. They, were, they took away only that time people who worked with the, the garment uh, mm -hmm. industry and the leather industry, they went to Caracal. Gotcha. You see? The one the way because the ghetto was divided in two sections, ghetto A and ghetto B. Ghetto A was Arbeitslose in German, the one who don't work, women, children, you know, all people. So ghetto B was beschäftigt, the one who have commandos, you know, which were working for, for the for companies, you know. There was companies, big companies were people working in this, they survived because of this, many of them. I get, Leon, I just want to remind you, we have about 15 or 20 minutes. So. Yeah, so I, what I, I could talk to you all day, truly. I mean, I'm, I'm moved by everything that you're saying. I want people to understand uh, the survival part, the, your horse, horse adjutant, that's the book, which we'll put the link in there, tells that story. So. Eventually, you trained the horse for the commandant, which is tell tell them what adjutant means and how that all okay, came into play. Uh, no, knowing, hang in there just one second. Yeah. In Tarno, at the end, Leon and his best friend were put into the pit with the bodies to get their valuables. And that would have been the end if it wasn't for the Hopstam Fuhrer, the commandant, to get uh, to say, "I want those boys out." And at uh, and he's talking to other people that say no, and they got him out. And then he put them and the horse on a train to the next camp. And that's where the story picks yeah, up. You have to understand the liquidation of the ghettos, were by special forces. They all I, when I pay attention. Around here, they had written on the, uh, how do you call this, on the mansion, Zdondedienst, 
you know, as a boy, I didn't look on his head with a, with a, how do you call it, with a, with a shrinking head, you know, with the head on the, the SS, you know. But I looked, they had here a sign, Zonderdienst. So you see, it was, I, I couldn't understand what, what does it mean. I, I found it out later, you know. This was special troops, mm -hmm. which were assigned at the liquidation of the ghetto walked in three companies. But Leo, we have about so, we have about 15 minutes okay. and we need to get the yeah. story to to just to you, understand. You, it. you see, the environment is very wide to tell you how how the liquidations were going on. The execution was going on without a stop. When the three companies walked in, anyone who was caught on the street was shot. Anyone who came out from the house was shot. They liquidated. This was their part of liquidation. I was watching it. In a, in a, they put me with a horse. In a, it was a, a, a singer place where I used to make wood, you know, cut wood. There I was until the, after the, they finished the, the three day executions. Three days. You know, they took me out and the few. There's one more alive in, in New York. Yeah. There was one in Israel where he took us to take to pick up the barrage to bring it on the on the seventh day. This was the end of Ghetto Tarnu, and they took in, the commandant Bleicher, which was in charge over the ghetto. You know, he told told me, wash yourself, clean yourself from the blood from the everything. And I'm going to send you with a horse right away to Shabnia. And I went, and my, my friend Morris Blauner was one which was also with a horse. They took two guards, Ukrainian accelerator guards. People don't know even who they, who they are. They were collaborators with the, with the, with the SS. You know, they took us under guard, they brought us to the new camp, Shabnia, where there I was working in this table with the horse and I cleaned this horse, everything, you know, until until the liquidator became the when I went to Auschwitz. This was a, a camp where uh, which uh, before us, before the Jews, they executed the Russian uh, POWs. We came there, it was about three and a, 3,000 went to Auschwitz from there. From the 3,000, 2,500 went to the gas chamber, and I went between the 500 selected to, to go to work. And can you tell them about the selection? Because that's where the title comes from. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Please. I, the, when the nighttime, we all we were nude. Uh, the, it was so quiet, you, you, you couldn't hear nothing. In the 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 big shots, the the killers dressed beautifully in white gloves, you know, with with the titles, doctors, even doctors. Then in the we were in the one line on the commercial station. There was a selection. And this was the the question. The roof, you know. I will never forget that. This will stay with my life. Beru means profession. So I said, "Ich bin ein Verdad, you know." So they're looking on each other like this. You know. Explain what that word is, because you said it. It's a hard word for us to understand. Uh, the Verdad, you know. Yes. Is uh, if you if is you, the horse adjutant. You the horse adjutant. Right. Uh, the, Got it. it. You see, if you have a a, a a horse and you sleep with it. You clean it, you dress it to the higher officer or to anybody who is above high. This they call the adjutant. Normally, this is a military uh, word. I didn't know this is a military word, but I, I, when they asked me my profession, I said, I'm a horse, a further German, further adjutant. So they were laughing too. They didn't realize what I'm talking. 
I, and I tried to explain him. You see, in German, I spoke a very good German. I clean the horse, I sleep with the horse, I bring the horse to the commandant, you know, dressed to ride. The, oh, so the, you know, th this is how they understood it when I said it. And they said, Peshwin to the right, they mean disappear to the right. Right. So that's how that was the selection. The selection. Yeah. Um, because depending the, on your profession is whether they liquidated you, whether they killed you or not. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not exactly true. A lot of um, a lot of things. If they were physically not fit, many things. But let me um, try to uh, go right to liberation because we're going to run out of time. The story is written in his book, and it's some story. The uh, the however, the story of the liberation is is something that I think Leon should explain. Today is the day. The 27th of January, 1945, the front, the, the Russian front, the first Ukrainian front under Marshal Konya liberated the whole vicinity of Europe, not only Auschwitz. I was in Auschwitz III, Buna. I was not able to go on the dead march. January 15, they, they put us all on a appell place and they wanted uh, they announced he was really the order of the of of the high command Himmler that the camp is will be evacuated. This was January 15, 1945. And uh, who cannot walk sh should go on the infirmary because the one who cannot walk will be sh will be executed on the road. So, now you want to, 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 to the name of the Hauptsturmführer? Yeah, I know the name, Hauptsturmführer Rokach, you see. And he announced this, so I went and I was injured in the neck from the bombing on December 26th. From the American uh, carpet I, bombing. Yeah, the bombing, you know. So I couldn't go because I had a hole in my neck and I had an infection. Mm -hmm. So I went, he said, if you cannot go, you go to the infirmary. And I went, that I came on the block. I had a German block marked, a very good man. He said, and this was a Jugen block. Everybody was there under 18. There were uh, Jewish boys from Holland, from Hungary, from France, you know, the old mixed boys, it was a, a barrack where only yeah, those under 18 could be. And this, I, I, I didn't go on a death march. I remained there 10 days, almost 10 days. From the 15, 15th, there was the appel, mm -hmm. the announcement. 16, 17, 18, they were walking out. Leon, did you days. have any food Pardon? for 10 days? Did you have any food? No food. For 10 days. Did you have any water? No water. You had snow. I was drinking snow. You found an onion. Oh, a dry onion. Yeah, yeah. Dry. A yeah. package. I eat the dry onion. I thought the fire comes out from my mouth. I didn't have what to drink. So you can imagine the state of his mind. How how heavy were you at Eight, liberation? 80 pounds. 80 pounds. How heavy are you today? 170. Five. Right. So 80 pounds. pounds. We're talking about a big guy that's 80 pounds, 10 days with no food. He's absolutely going to have to be uh, out of his mind by that point. Yes. And so what 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 happens? Yeah, tell us, because what, what did you feel when you were liberated? Well, no, the, what happens is the, the, we oh, tell us. About 200, they're almost dead, died. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the guy saw me walking, says, come help us to throw out the dead people from the bar. It was, the liberation was on the front line, you see. So we did not, I did not realize the bullets were flying and I was standing outside, you know, but because the infirmary was next to the end of the camp. There was no electric uh, wires already. So the, the guy, which was 
uh, the guard was already not the SS with the, the uh, how do you call it, the shrinking heads, the, the, uh, the, the signs. I can. SS. Mm -hmm. You know, they all the, the SS carried not a regular EU. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they would ask him, you know, when, when you have no food, nothing. So he tells me in Germany, tell me, I don't have any food either. This was dancing. And it took quite a while. I, I I took a blanket, you know, laying full of blankets from the dead people. It covered, and I was standing by the wires. In the morning, I remember this was this day. Today. Today, yes. I was standing, and I see two guys with machine guns. First thing I thought, this is Germans. I didn't know. You know, they, I had Ijib Barak, Ijib Barak, you know, you know Ijib Barak, well, I understand Polish. So he, he, and I, he said, we walked in I, to the Barak. I walked in with the other guys. What does it mean, what he said in Polish? It means get him to the Barak. Get into the Barak. Because barracks. the bull, bullets were flying. Mm -hmm. and, and they were standing, they were, they were, you know, the front line. Right. And who are those people? The Russian, the Ukrainians. Right, and so that's an interesting distinction because it's the Russian army, but it's the Ukrainian Russian army. The first Ukrainian, they interviewed when they walked in eleven o'clock. Yeah, they they on a horse, two horses. They said, yeah, "We are we are soldiers of the first Ukrainian front under Marshal Korn." Yeah. Leon, we need to have one closing statement. Yeah. What is what is your goal by telling the story of your life? To, to all of us, what is your goal? What do you? What is? What did your father say? And what is your goal? My goal is listen to be free. If you ha have freedom, you have a chance to leave. But if you lose freedom, you're dead. That's distinct. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, yeah. I'm. Yeah. I'm. I usually am not speechless, but it. It just it there is so much going on in our world um, with anti-Semitism and denial conspiracy theories and to be able to have a survivor on the show is such a blessing and I think it's so important that people see and hear your words you can still hear the passion and sadness and anger when you speak about certain things. And I think that that just breathes life into the story. I dedicated my life to teaching. All my life. Not money, not work. I had to tell this to the youngsters. They should not hate. They should get rid of this word hate. Because if you're going to have this word hate, nothing good can come out. Get rid of hate. Uh, I'd, like no... to, I'd like to make one more statement. Leon married, um, what year was it? In 58. In 1958, to Betty Sternlich, who with her two sisters was a member of Schindler's List. So there's a whole nother thing going on here. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us. We Listen, have a thank you both. People. You all have to go, but I am blessed, Leon. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, thank you, Stephen Schusty, for bringing him on. I appreciate you both so much. God bless. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys soon.